Hey, it's Alex Rackler from Board Game Co, and this is Two Back or Not to Back, where we're going to go through a variety of crowdfunding campaigns, talking about what the campaigns have, what the pledge levels, all the various things, and of course, should you back it or not. It's going to be a short week again this week. We actually missed last week, and we're going to be missing next week, and despite all of that, it's a short week, which is great for you, because, you know, less campaigns to back, more money saved, and, uh more irresponsible decisions to be made in other aspects of your life or possibly just other board games, but this time at retail instead, because sometimes there's actually where you can find some really good board games, which is a great and very smooth tangent into the Cult of the Now. Cult of the Now is a segment where I take a look at a currently available game. Instead of talking about all the crowdfunding games that you can go ahead and back and they can show up in a year, a year and a half, or maybe they don't show up, maybe there's an extra shipping charge, or maybe you just lost interest in it by the time it showed up. Cult of the Now is a regular reminder that you can go ahead and get great games that are available now. Crowdfunding is full of promise and the, the options for the future and help great games come to life and in fact our cult of the now today is a game that did come to life through crowdfunding but in case you missed it you can go ahead and check out project l over on game nerds for the mere price of 28 dollars i actually believe project l square one is going to be launching shortly over on a uh, kickstarter soon sometime soon so in case you want to go ahead and get this little chiclet inspired candy themed board game that's really just a polyominoes disguised as a top nope other way around it's a tableau builder disguised as a polyomino game project l is delightful highly recommend checking it out and you can check out a ton of content on this game and see if it's for you without having to like wonder or this or wait or any of those things. So Project L is going to be our cult of the now. And with that, let's go ahead and dive into the board and the crowd crowdfunding spot, starting off with the uh, board game adjacent. We have a few board game adjacent campaigns, although starting off, we should go with the usual reminder and disclaimer that I do work for GameFound. I am CMO of GameFound. Take that into account as we go through this video. But starting off with uh, AR Vault Heroes and Companions by Awaken Realms. This is a continuation of their AR Vault. Last year, they did... um. Dice, I think. They did a bunch of dice, a bunch of, uh, you know, very intricate dice faces. I think that campaign did pretty decently, and this campaign is not doing that great. This is arguably the worst performing Awakened Realms campaign to date, with only $112,000. Now, this is going to be bringing you a bunch of things, a combination of miniatures, of dice, things like that, various stuff, and they have a bunch of options. They actually have a great little guided option for, you know, who are you, what are you here for, do you want augments to Awaken Realms existing games? Well, they have that pledge. Do you just want a bunch of dice? They have that. Do you want a bunch of miniatures? As well as the little companions and the various sculpts. They have that as well. They have all this. RPG, miniatures, upgrade Awaken Realms, or if you're looking for beautiful carved dice, you have all these various options. And they can, of course, you can get whatever you want. This is just a guide to like, hey, this is probably the thing that's right for you. They have a bunch of stuff. Again, this is not my jam. I'd like to buy stuff for actual games. Well, I guess upgrading the Awaken Realms stuff would be the most relevant to me. For me, uh, cool dice are nice, but they're just that, and miniatures are nice, but they're just that. I like to have things that focus on the gameplay experience, but in case you're interested in any of that, AR Vault, Heroes and Companions, a bunch of options for you there. We also have So-Called Living, books one and two. Now, if you're wondering why I'm covering a comic book thing, that's a fair, fair question. I don't usually cover cover comic books, but this is actually coming to you from Board Game Coffee, from Mark Meyer, Board Game Coffee, who's in the board game space, another content creator, and I want to go ahead and shout these out in case you are interested in any kind of comic books or whatnot, but Jack is learning to live his life as a vampire in a world where werewolves run the mob, and bunnies threaten our very existence. I actually started the comic book. I haven't gotten to the part where the but I have not gotten to the part where the bunnies threaten their existence. That does sound more compelling, and I probably should go ahead and finish it to get to that part. But either way, so called living, great art, a good story so far. Again, I only just started, so I didn't get very far into it yet. But in case you're interested in uh, either supporting Board Game Coffee in general, if you like his content, or alternatively, if you like comic books and wanted to go ahead and get into this. This is so-called living over on Kickstarter. Then we have over on GameFound, we have Mr. Meeple Board Games Colo Season 7. This is not even the last one. We have four board game adjacent campaigns today. We have Mr. Meeple Board Games Colo Season 7. This is, as it sounds, Season 7 of Mr. Meeple's catalog of various uh, board game clothing. Effectively, they got socks, they got shirts, they got... Socks, they got shirts, they might have other things, but I just know about the socks and shirts. I've actually had, I have a few of these, I was going to say had, but I have a few of these. I still wear the socks. The shirts I don't wear as often, I'm very much a fan of tea turtles and or things that are very cool in the winter, very warm in the winter, but I have enjoyed a few of their shirts over here, let's see what they have. They, they had a few of the designs that I still have and still do wear. I have these socks in particular, the blue and orange, they're channel colors, so I support that. But they have a bunch of fun socks over here, they have a bunch of shirts, and a variety of clothing. In case you're interested in any board game related clothing, you can go ahead and check out their options, check out the designs, see if it's something that interests you. There are a bunch of options here for you. That's going to be Mr. Meeple and a bunch of board game related clothing. Then lastly, we have Vizzles. Vizzles in general, we cover these because they feel board game adjacent. And I don't know for sure why I cover these, and probably because it's from Sam Milham, who does a series of board games, as well as the series of visual puzzles, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a visual puzzle where the game begins when the puzzle ends. Effectively, it's going to give you a bit of a story, and where finishing is just the beginning. This is their newest one. They have a zombie collection now being added. I'm not going to heavily go through these over here. They have a bunch. They have Alice in Wonderland, Witches and Wizards, Zombies, Pirates and P 
Peter Pan and Neverland, or a whole bunch of these different options. And again, they're going to give you a little, little bit of a story, a little bit of a thing to go through, and I don't know, art and story and puzzle and all these things to check out. They're Vizzles. I've never tried them. They always do look cool. And they have a bunch of options ranging from an early bird puzzle for $24, all the way up to uh, the full all-in for $197, bringing you all six of their large puzzles and all six mini puzzles as well. Now, you don't have to spend nearly that much. You can get, you know, 138 for the six large ones if that's more your jam. Bunch of options for you here. How it works, you go ahead and you finish your puzzle, open your envelope, and find all the riddles. Solve the riddles and locate the answers on the artwork. So kind of a, almost a cross between a puzzle and then... What's that game? Micro Macro Crime Cities. That's going to be a bit of a combination of what you're getting here with these Vizzles. And that's what we have for the board game adjacent category, which brings us to the Not Yet Funding category. In the Cancelled and Not Yet Funding category, and this one's in the Not Yet Funding category, although, wow, since I last checked this, this is definitely going to be funded by the time the campaign ends. We have 9,570 euro out of a 10,000 euro goal. We have the Arena of Burdom over on Kickstarter, a skirmish game, a fast-paced, crazy, fun arena brawler for both casual and hardcore gamers. This looks like a, looks like a more accessible, lighter skirmish game there's a gameplay video you can check out uh, they do have miniatures sort of by that I mean they basically have a miniature option that they're going to unlock uh, the options to get miniatures as an add-on once they hit 30,000 euro that part looks more you know skeptical so I'm not sure exactly how that's going to play out I am guessing it won't hit that part but that means one of those you know chicken and egg situations because there might be people only only interested in the game if it actually hits that number but then if it doesn't hit that number they're not interested in the game which leads to a, ne a little negative cycle of not actually well hitting the number but we have the standard pledge for 40 euro for this uh, standee based uh, skirmish game and then we have the full on well there's no, no other standard pledge because the, the standard pledge is the pledge that there is and then there's a support pledge for 10 euro but then also there is the um there is the miniature add-on if they hit 30,000 euro that's going to be an option to go ahead and get miniatures for the game as well as extra characters and all this other stuff that they've already shown for the various stretch goals so it funded i mean not funded it will be funding but uh you'll see how well it does by the time it's all done it does have eight days left to go but again that 30,000 euro is a hard number to hit moving on to the starting off with the uh the funded projects over here we have ai apocalypse the auto battle card game thirty-one thousand dollars, eight hundred twenty-two dollars, thirty-one thousand eight hundred twenty-two 821 dollars raised 776 backers and nine days to go on AI Apocalypse, an auto battler game. Now, if you don't know what an auto battler is, there's a bunch of options out there. I've played the uh, Hearthstone auto battler. They say it's also based off of, they say it's based on Hearthstone and pets or super pets or something like that. I haven't actually played that one, but uh, auto battler is basically the idea where you build a team or something. You build something beforehand and then you just let it all run and go. So the only auto battler board game that I'm currently aware of is one called Challengers, which already has an expansion. I believe it won this build this year. It won something or other, but uh, an auto battler basically has you you building something and then just running it to see how well things go. So you so you have the, the deck building, the deck construction, the team building, and then once you hit go, you see how everything resolves with a combination of a luck in there. There's going to usually be some degree of luck as far as how things unfold. It can be purely deterministic depending how you build it, but this is going to have that core idea. You go ahead, you gather cards, you use those cards to build out a team. As you actually get wounded, you'll find you'll unlock more cards. So you're going to get, you know, wounded, you're going to start dying, but you'll unlock more cards over there. So that gives you even more options for how you're going to continue to level up as you go through round after round. But obviously, if you get hit too many times, you will die and lose, which is where it's uh, basically going to be having you build out a team, develop and upgrade that team, and see how it runs across several rounds. So that's going to be the basic core idea of A Apocalypse. They also have an expansion over here. So they have an expansion pledge. The core pledge is going to be $30 for the A Apocalypse core game. And for $38, you get the full gameplay, which gives you the additional expansion, which gives you a co-op campaign mode. The idea of co-op and campaign mode does sound fun. I like the premise of Auto Battlers. This one does look fun. We have Miss, Miss, Miss Bubblegum with the Hulk arm, all these, the idea of upgrading and all that. I do like the concept of them in video games. I actually am currently enjoying, there's a backpack one. There's like, a, I can't remember the name of it. There's a backpack auto battler that I've really been enjoying recently. But uh, there are a lot of fun auto battlers out there. The idea of them is very appealing. They have not been heavily turned into board games, at least not yet. So we'll see how those go. These should be loading. I think that's a Kickstarter issue. But anyways, that's kind of the core idea of what you have over here. You also have some additional pledges if you want, you know, five to eight players and all that. But that's the core idea of what this game is. As far as should you back or should you not, will it hold its value? Game looks very compelling, uh, at least for me personally. It's my own personal bias. I like the idea of the game. I like that. I want to see... When I, when I play Challengers, I, I thought Challengers... The core concept of bringing an auto battler to the tabletop, I thought was a great idea. But ultimately, the execution is everything. Will it work? Will it not work? Will it deliver? Will it, like, how will it be? And I thought Challengers was an okay start, but I wanted to see more auto battlers and board games. So I am happy to see this. I have no idea if it's good. They have competitive co solo and co op, simultaneous gameplay, tons of cards, no downtime, all those fun things. Very intrigued by the game, but uh, no idea if this one will or won't be the game that I hoped Challengers would be. But it does look cool, and I like having that co op uh, campaign expansion added on as well. 
well. As far as the, uh, you know, show you back in terms of value, I'm skeptical it will hold this value. With 776 backers, obviously that number will grow, probably cross a thousand backers or so by the time the campaign is done, but nonetheless, it's not a ton of demand, and the price points do come across as fairly reasonable, but it's for a card game, it's for a bunch of cards, so it's reasonable-ish. It's not like, you know, a crazy good price, not a crazy bad price, I just don't know if the demand will be there. I don't think it's a bad back by, like, any large extent, but I, I'm also skeptical you'll get your money back, especially once you factor in shipping on that. Moving on, we have Super Trains, Superhero Trains Defending a Robot City. This is from the creator of Quest Kids, which is a kid-based game. And if you take a look at this, you'll see that this is also a kid-based game. It's a easy-to-learn train game for two to five conductors, ages seven plus. Fifteen thousand dollars raised, 108, 188 backers. This is basically a kid-based. You know, uh, you have a boss monster. There's gonna be a boss you're fighting against. I don't remember his name. You're gonna have your own individual trains with their own individual powers, as far as how they are, operate. Here we have Roller, Roller the semi, the evil semi truck, or truck or not. There's a full uh, live gameplay you can check out. Uh, Tom versus Jimmy over on the Dice Tower. So if you want to see a kid experience in a with it. I know Tom was a big fan of Quest Kids, so you know it makes sense over there. But that's basically what we have for Super Trains, and there's an expansion as well. There's a few different options as far as what you can back. We have the retail edition of the game for $44. We have the Kickstarter Deluxe Edition over there, for $59. And then we have the various add-ons if you want to $84. And then we can go ahead and get the whole Quest Kids stuff, Treasure Falls games, all the games for $159 for this. As far as should you back or should you not, will it hold this value? It, kind of the same situation as uh, AI Apocalypse. There's not going to be a ton of availability on this one. So if you do want the game, your options are primarily crowdfunding or likely the second-hand market, but the second-hand market's not going to be that much present. It's a uh, 188 backers, there's not going to be a ton of these copies out there. So if you do want the game, this might be your only way to really guarantee it, realistically. I hate, to, I hate going with the FOMO, but that is present with a game with this low level of support to an extent. But ultimately, I do not think it will hold this value, at least looking at Quest Kids. I'm skeptical this is one that would hold this value overall. Moving on, we have Horror on the Orient Express, the board game. This is going to be the big one for this week. We have 8,462 backers, $847,000 raised, and 11 days to go from this game from Chaosium, from, uh, oh my gosh, what's his name? I always forget. From, um... Adam Kopinski, designer of Lords of Ragnarok, Nemesis, and uh, Horror on the Orient Express now. It's a Call of Cthulhu board game over here. And this is basically bringing you a cooperative game, which is a train. There's a train that you're trying to manage the, the journey because the journey is being assaulted by monsters and vampires and all these bad things as the train slowly moves towards its destination. You're trying to figure out where the cultists are. There's a bit of a mini deduction game going on. It's, it is cooperative, but there's, there's kind of rules in place as far as how things operate. So as you uncover information, you can start putting together a piece of information as far as what is going on in the train, who's who, and what you, who you can who you need to kill, who's safely to kill, and who's going to hurt you more as you go through it. You're going to have your own asymmetric characters, you're going to be leveling up across the course of this journey, and there's going to be a ton of production over here from a, you know, a cardboard train, which they say in the FAQ, you will not have to disassemble it, it does fit in the box once assembled, as well as tons of miniatures and a giant uh, over-the-top uh, demon head that's going to be attacking the train, as well as a plastic little train. Lots of fun options for you over here, but this is a game designed by Adam Kopinski, a cooperative horror themed game with tons of abilities and a lot to manage. I did have a chance to play this one on TTS, uh, not a full game mind you, but uh, overall I'd say I enjoyed what I got to see with the caveat that I didn't even get a full game under my belt. So just, I, either the bones on this are clearly very good, but I cannot tell you whether there's a good overall arc or how much I'd otherwise enjoy it. But it's going to be uh, the Horror and the Orient Express, the board game from Adam Kopinski from Chaosium. As far as the uh, pledge levels over here, we have the core pledge for $98. That's going to give you, you know, Horror and the Orient Express, the Investigators Unveiled expansion as well as the Kickstarter exclusive Nightmarish Orient Express promo miniature that's gonna be this little train over here and this uh you know investors unveiled expansion I believe is upping the amount of investigators you have taking you from four to eight investigators on the uh, the game over here I believe that's what it was if I recall correctly I think so let me see if I can find over here we have to get the game receive the investigators unveiled expansion but what is the investigators unveiled I believe I saw somewhere that was extra investigators on the train, which is a good thing in theory. Let's see if I can find it over here. Nope, nope, nope. Somewhere, maybe. Monsters. Look at all these miniatures over here. Got some fun little miniatures. These, a lot of these, by the way, the vampire in particular is interesting because the vampire is designed to hang on the edge of the cardboard train, which is why you can see a little divot over here as it kind of hangs there. But I can't see the Investigators Unveiled expansion, so I'm not going to heavily focus on that, but I do... Here we go. Here we go. It takes you... Uh, you gain 10 playable characters instead of the 4 available from the base game, so that's a good thing overall. And then you also have the uh, VIP Passenger, which is going to add the uh, the Consumed by the Void campaign expansion as well, giving you a campaign way to go through the experience and, as well. That's going to be $145 for that, or $98 for the base game. Uh, this one, and here's the giant miniature over here. This is the thing that's going to be like hanging over the train, completely encompassing it. Looks very cool. Looks very demonic, because that makes sense. This is is a horror themed Cthulhu game. But anyways, as far as should you back or should you not, will hold its value. 
Short version is I think it will, but not a guarantee. This is designed by Adam Kopinski, who to a certain extent brings his own audience to the table. The game looks very cool, they've been demoing it at lots of conventions, the overall feedback from people who've played it has been fairly positive, there's lots of coverage on the game you can check out. So overall, there's just a solid game, solid team, solid everything over here, as well as a decent discount on MSRPs from what you're actually getting, as well as a limited availability on some of the extras over here. So if you just want to get the game and just not worry about anything else, you'll be able to get the cheapest version of it at retail. This will have retail availability, but if you want all the cool stuff and or the cheaper options for, you know, the various uh, discounts on MSRP you're getting for basically everything, this is one that I do think will hold its value. It's not a guarantee. It's not like a, um, it's, not, it's, a it's a little bit of an a weird situation because Chaosium doesn't usually have a ton of crowdfunding games that take off but this is a very specific one that clearly has an audience even now and usually that audience now converts to an audience down the road as well especially if the game is good which in this case at least from the people I know who've played it and of course my own brief experience with it I do think it's a good game and I do think it's going to hold that audience long term once it does show up on people's tables. So that's Horror and Orient Express the board game one that may well be worthy of backing. Moving on we have Mythwin Reprint and new content. 4,440 two backers, $426,000 raised, 12 days to go, Mythwin reprint and new content is exactly that. It's a reprint of Mythwin from Open Owl Studios, as well as new content for the game, all the new content that actually does sound very fun because it's the Friends and Families expansion. Great video by the way, I really enjoyed this, I believe this was done by Tim Chun, if not mistaken, but uh, overall great campaign video, really showcase highlights, gives you that lifestyle feel for the game. Uh, but over here we have Mythwin. Mythwin in general is a single player or cooperative cozy style game in which you're basically building out the valley of Mythwin. You show up in the valley, there's some sprites, there's a little of a story, you start having goals and adventures, and you're going through a game where you don't really win or lose, you just build and go through the journey. You take control of one of four asymmetric characters, or five with the expansion from the original game. I believe it's the innkeeper as the fifth one, then there's the ranger, the farmer, I don't remember them. There's the ranger, the farmer, like there's a tailor type person, but it's not called the tailor, it's called something else. Blacksmith maybe, maybe a blacksmith, and then, what am I missing? It's gonna bother me. The ranger? The farmer, the blacksmith, what was the last mechanic? I mean, I'm probably in the campaign page somewhere. Either way, there's one more character, but I don't remember what it was. And then there's the innkeeper from the expansion, and those characters all have unique arcs to the way you're going to grow and develop those characters as you play through the game, because you are both growing your own valley of Mythwin over here, as well as your own character's uh, strengths and weaknesses as you go through the game, and you're trying to just go through this experience. You can start with one character, or two hand two characters, and then pivot and shift to different characters as you go through it, or you can play a cooperatively where everyone's controlling their own characters as you slowly contribute to Mythwin's success, accomplish goals, deal with the weather, the events, all those fun things along the way. So lots of fun things going on in the game overall, but it is very much a game that has no clear end goal. It's a game that is just about the journey of building and exploring. Again, the often example given is if you play games like Stardew Valley, it's going to fall into that same kind of idea. There is there are, there are is a story and a sequence of events, and to some extent, if you go through those and you're done with those, you will lose some of the reason to continue playing. But past that, you're just trying to build and go and journey and all those things. I covered this during the prototype phase. I've actually been diving into the final copy. I was hoping to have a review up for the campaign ends I don't know if I will because I really want to try all the different characters but overall I mean I'll have a review at some point I just don't know exactly when I will say my opinion of this game has gone up since the prototype phase I think they've cleaned up a few of the rough edges ultimately it's a game that's not for me long term it's a game that I think I want that full destination but I have been enjoying going through the characters and optimizing them to the point that I do want to kind of go through a bit more and see a bit more of the events and the story and build out my characters and get a sense for their arcs and then for me it's probably one I'm going to pack up and move on from once I've got to see a little bit more of this world but I do respect what they're doing and I think it definitely has an audience it's very clear it has an audience people have been diving into it and that now over here they have the friends and families expansion I believe that's what it's called and the friends and family expansion basically gives you more incentive to to cooperate within the game one of the pieces of feedback the crafter that's the last one. One of the pieces of feedback that in general I've seen, and it's definitely true for me, is that most people I know prefer to play this game solo. It's a fun little solo game where you build your character. There's not a lot of incentive to play this multiplayer. You're just doing your own thing with some degree of, of shared cooperation. So there's other games I'd rather play if I have another person at the table. And to that end, the Friends and Families expansion aims to address that, to improve the multiplayer, ex uh, multiplayer experience by giving you specific custom interactions between all the various characters of the game. So you're going to have various ways that one character interacts with another. Maybe the farmer plants a certain crop and the tailor can use that crop or the crafter or whatnot. They can use that crop and they can in some way utilize that for this or that and then the innkeeper comes along and does, I don't know the characters well enough to actually talk about this, but in some way there'll be some degree of, of combination that really drives more of an incentive to actually have that cooperative play and rewards that cooperative play so it doesn't just feel like you're playing a 
multiplayer solitaire game cooperatively. So that's the that's the goal of Friends and Families expansion. The pledge levels over here. Oh, and before we dive into pledge levels, they also announced that they're going to have a bunch of new expansions coming out as well. Not part of this Kickstarter, but they announced that for the next you know whatever next in the future they're going to have more more expansions coming. They have two character expansions, one from Nikki Valens and then one from uh, Daryl Andrews and uh, Jenna Beasley from the Board Game Garden co-designing another character expansion. So pledge levels over here. We have fifty four dollars Canadian, so forty dollars US for the new gameplay. That's going to be the Friends and Families expansion. Uh, we're going to have over here the eighty five dollars for the Mythwin Core Box, a hundred ninety dollars for the Mythwin Myth Drop. So that's going to be the uh, the shaded characters. We have one hundred twenty dollars for everything new for the game. So if you want all the new stuff for the game, you don't need whatever. You already have the old. We have Mythwin gameplay for one hundred and seventy dollars. It's all the gameplay content for Mythwin. We have one hundred and seventy six for Mythwin gameplay with Myth Drop. Is that only six dollars more? That's barely more. I mean, there's only four characters, so I guess that makes sense. We have $354 for the all-in, and then $368 for the all-in myth drop over here. So basically, a lot of ways to spend various amounts of money, but honestly, you don't need to spend that much. You can get the core myth and experience for that $90 range. It'll give you most of what you need to see if this is a game for you. You don't need to go all in this one, and clearly they're covering the fact that they plan on having additional content. So even if you have that FOMO aspect, you will have the opportunity to get that additional content down the road. So you shouldn't have too much FOMO on this one. Back, if you want to try this one out, it's a very unique experience. Uh, and then that's going to bring us to what if it's not for you? Should you back or should you not? Will it hold its value and all of that? And the short version is it seems like so far it has done a decent job holding its value. Uh, looking at the sales I found on eBay and the Board Game Geek Marketplace and comparing it to the original campaign, this is one that has done a decent job of being in the range of people, what people paid for. I've seen people selling it for a little bit less. I've seen people selling it for a little bit more. But that's overall pretty good for a game like this. This one is always a tricky one because the concept of a game that has no win condition uh, that we've seen it more recently with um what's that game oh my gosh that the village game from pegasus which i'm bl completely blanking on the name Dofromantic. Dofromantic had that as well, but uh, before Dofromantic came along, I think this might have been the first game, I'm sure there's others somewhere, but this is the first, the main game that was like a known that had a game that had no real endpoint. That was always a fascinating concept, and how well that would be received is always a question mark. But it's been received well enough so far that people are still interested in those games, trying to hunt down copies and get their hands in it, so overall it has done a decent job holding its value. Uh, the second Kickstarter, I don't know for sure if it will hold or continue with that, uh, you know, continue with that holding its value so far, but at the very least it seems to be doing a decent job, so if you are interested in backing it one, backing this one, you're likely not going to be losing that much. Maybe the cost of shipping, any of that, but nothing too crazy. Moving on, we have Millennium Blaze again. 1,511 backers. You have $154,000 raised, 17 days to go. This is basically Millennium Blaze coming back to your table with some new content for the game, as well as the option to get all the content, because while you can get the base game fairly readily, the expansion stuff for Millennium Blades is hard to get your hands on. If you're hunting the second-hand market, I haven't seen a lot of retail options for it. As far as what Millennium Blades is, Millennium Blades is a TCG that's not actually a TCG. It's a game that mimics collectible card games. The idea of Millennium Blades is in Millennium Blades, you're playing a game called Millennium Blades, and you're opening booster packs and trading cards and building your deck, and so you're li literally going through the concept of a TCG within this game that mimics the TCG. So it's not actually a TCG, but it gives you that TCG booster pack kind of experience in an interesting, fun little way. That's the core concept of what Millennium Blades is doing. Uh, past that, the actual gameplay is going to be, you know, again, you open booster packs, assemble your decks, and then face off against each other, help others build your decks, you get friendship points and different things like that, but that's going to be uh, Millennium Blades. Uh, it's been overall very well received. It's a game that has a lot of people who really like it. I've never had a chance to play this one myself, but I know a lot of people who have enjoyed Millennium Blades, spoken very highly of it, and it's very unique in the space. I don't know any other game that's doing what it's doing, which is already a reason to stand out to a large extent. Uh, this is coming to you from Level 99 Games, and this is the reprint and, well, all the new stuff for it. We have the Multiverses Beyonder, which is going to be the new content for the game. It's the 8th anniversary of Millennium Blades. It includes 53 all-new cars, including an ever-before-released character. So we have all that for the new content. We have the Millennium Blades New Gamer over here for $88, which is basically, you know, the $18 over here, plus $70 from Millennium Blades Core set, but you want to be mindful of that. We'll come back to that during the Should You Back It. We have the new expansions for $89. This is for anyone who has Millennium Blades and set rotations, so if you want the new content for there, this will complete your collection. We have $120 for all expansions, and set rotation is a hard-to-get expansion, so if you do want it, that's not the craziest thing to back. And we have uh, the gameplay complete option for $188, as well as the Blades from Millennia for $275, and I've got Blades from Millennia for $300. This is all the various extra content. Now, I'm not going to dive heavily into every single pledge level as far as Should You Back It, Should You Not. We'll hold this value, but I will dive into 
into a few. Most specifically, I'll start off with this uh, new gamer over here. You should probably skip on this pledge. Uh, this pledge, and it depends on where you are, it depends on your uh, uh, your access to games. But overall, this new gamer option for $88 is basically $70 for the core game versus this uh, Multiverse of Beyonder. But it also costs an additional $10 to ship versus the Multiverse of Beyonder, which means you're really paying $80 for the core game. And honestly, you can get it for like $64 from uh, Game Nerds. And then assuming you have a $100 order, it's free shipping. And that's probably true for a lot of different online stores. So in general, you want to take a look and you're also getting it earlier and sooner as well. So that's another factor. So in general, if you're looking for the core set, there are probably cheaper options to get your hands in it. But if you're looking for the various expansion content that is harder to find, then that makes more sense to get because it has done a decent job holding its value, especially on the expansion content. And in general, it's just harder to get your hands on across the board. So to show you back at this, I'm not going to break down every single pledge level. But as a general rule, the pledges that have a core box, you might want to consider not bother getting those and just getting the expansion content and then getting the core box at retail now in case you missed out on it. Or of course, you don't have to get it at all because it's a game that's been out for who knows how long. And as usual, if you're only considering it now, the usual question is why? Why now? Because you've ignored this in the past who knows how long, you probably safely could skip it as well. Next up we have Garden Geckos, a puzzly tile laying game of geckos and bugs in a garden. This one's very much giving me aqua vibes if you played that from the OP, the way, the general the way the tiles are laid out, the tile placement, trying to get things and point scoring optimization and all that. And the general idea of this game is basically going to be placing down tiles. You're gonna be placing down geckos on those tiles, on those little patterns. As you enclose and circle off those bugs, you're gonna be able to go ahead and get, you know, your hands on, get your hands on all those bugs based on who has the most area majority of them. Bunch of scoring little optimization things going on here. Uh, it's going to be a 549 backers, $27,000 raised, 23 days to go. It's going to have two pledge levels. It's going to be the basic deluxe game, well as the add-on access. The basic deluxe game for $45, as well as the add-on bundle for $89 for the game. Not a, not a ton of complexity, very simple, straightforward campaign. As far as should you back or should you not, will it hold this value? Unfortunately, less likely on this one. This is just a smaller creator thing in general, where it's like the, the price point of what you're getting versus the content just means I'm skeptical this is one that will hold its value, even just comparing to Aqua, which I said a second ago, like looking at the, what you can get there at retail versus this it's always a little harder and then the shipping of course as well it's always a little harder for these to keep up unfortunately so if you want to back it support the creator by all means but it's one that i don't think will hold this value moving on we have awkward guests to the burrow cases this is our last campaign of the day a very short video a 1300 backers forty two thousand dollars raised 23 days to go awkward guests 2 continues the well the series that started with awkward guests 1 shockingly enough then there was also the there was a follow-up oh my gosh what was the follow-up called it was called something else it was like a political one, but I don't remember offhand. I still have it and you play it. We have Arcus 2, the Burrow Cases over here. This is going to be a two-player game where you basically have a kind of a rounds where you have, you're going to be both be getting a case for the game. You both process the case as the mastermind, setting it up for your opponent to go ahead and go through it. And then you each take turns solving each other's cases as you go through it. One uh, dealing with the murder of the Burrow Sisters and one dealing with the planned murder of the, the next Burrow Sister over here. So it builds off what the first game campaign did, the first game did, but while being very different in the actual implementation of it at the same time. So if you like Arcus and you want something very very different if you want this kind of a mastermind rival situation if you're intrigued by that this is going to be one especially because Aquacus in general one of the critiques was always that it's not as great at lower player counts and so this is kind of the solution for that it's Aquacus 2 which is suitable for two players so if you want any of that that's going to be your main well the main p compelling aspect of this as far as the plus levels you have the clever investigator you have the investigator over here basic and straightforward you have the clever investigator which gives you some backstory this little uh, pamphlet which is like some backstory and characters might be helpful for crafting your cases but doesn't seem like it's gameplay at least from what I can tell on it. And we have the uh, Meticulous Investigator over here, which also gives you access to the original Aqua Guess uh, little extra pack from the original campaign that gave you some extra cases. So if you want any of that, that, that's something that you can't really get your hands on at retail. So if you want to get your hands on that, this is a nice opportunity to go ahead and back that and get extra content from the original Awkward Guests. And then we have some Investigators Club for like multiple pledge levels, things like that. That's kind of everything there. As far as should you back or should you not, will it hold this value? The short version is not as much. Awkward Guests is a very well-received game, but if you look at the price point on the secondhand market, it's one that in general has been out around for, it's been out enough and it's been around enough and has enough availability that it's one that doesn't do as great, especially once you consider the low price point combined with with the uh, cost of shipping, which is always tricky. The, the harsh reality of crowdfunding is that sometimes those $80, $90 games are an easier conversation because the $10, $15 shipping gets swallowed up within that much easier than the you know, $10, $15 on a $30 game. So that's always a little harder to deal with, but ultimately it is one that if you're interested in it, if you want that exclusive content, then it's likely just easy to go ahead and get it. But if you are looking at something that, what if it's not for you, then maybe just wait till retail, you'll be able to get your hands in it, probably a little bit cheaper and without some of that extra content, but you know, a little bit cheaper and seeing if it's a game for you. And that's what we have over here. As far as picks of the week, uh, picks of the week in general, I picked 
two games over here. I picked the my personal interest pick of the week, as well as the game that I think is most likely to hold its value. And for this week, the game that's most likely to hold its value is almost certainly Horror on the Orient Express. And not a guarantee by any means. It never really is. But looking at the overall price point, the game, the design, or the company, how well it's being received so far, I think this is one that if you do back it, it likely will hold its value if you find it's not a game for you. You'll likely be able to find someone who's able to pick it up in some way, shape, or form. And as far as my personal interest pick of the week, my personal interest pick of the week, I'm a little torn. I kind of, see, I'm kind of intrigued by Millennium Blades. I always have been very interested in it, but I don't know if I actually really, even, even like, I don't know. I, I, I like Millennium Blades. I, I do like the premise of it. I want to try it, but I'm going to go ahead and give my pick of the week to AI Apocalypse, the auto battle card game. This is a pick of the week that's based on optimism, to be very clear. I'm optimistic that this is a good game, but I, I really want to play a properly well done and rewarding auto battler game in the tabletop forum. And hey, maybe this will be that. Who really knows? We'll find out. That's going to be my personal interest pick of the week, AI Apocalypse, the auto, auto battle card game. And with that, as far as campaigns coming up next week, we have a few, but I believe Bebop Shuffle Swing Cap Blue is going to be launching next week. I say I believe because I know this campaign was already pushed off once, so there's a possibility this gets picked off, pushed off again. This is coming to you from Bitewing Games. They have three games, Cat Blue, Shuffle and Swing, and Bebop. Three different little games. Uh, Cat Blue is going to be more of a trick-taking, sort of trick-taking game from Anacrystia. Not really trick-taking, but more of a short card, card game. Shuffle and Swing is going to have you building instruments as you work with rats and mice, or I guess not rats, mice and cats and all those things. And then Bebop is going to have you helping seat various audiences in this very knizia like tile lane game but not designed by Renekizia, rather it's designed by Robert Herjavac, I think is his last name, I could be mistaken, but designer of Moon Rollers uh, from Ivy Games. Uh, he did Bebop and Shuffle and Swing, if I'm not mistaken. Those are going to be launching next week. And then additionally, we have Tiny Epic Game of Thrones with 12,000 people following the campaign. This is also going to be launching next week, and I'm very intrigued as to how well this one's going to do, because... Very intrigued. The crossover between a known series and a larger IP, very... I'm interested. I'm interested to see how the campaign will do. That, that's where we are. Tiny Epic Game of Thrones should be launching next week as well. And that's what we have for our two back or not two back. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I appreciate all of you being here. And as always, I hope you have a good one. Do you know what my Wi-Fi password is? My Wi-Fi password is Mickey, Minnie, Pluto, Huey, Louie, Dewey, Donald, Goofy, Boston. Because when I was setting it up, they said it has to have eight characters and a capital. <laughs>